I like daggers partly because they're so singular in purpose. There's a simplicity of intent and design there. The inner world that tries to make multi tools or little pocket pry bars with, you know, 15 different functions or, you know, Swiss army knives or, you know, Leatherman tools, which are all great products. And I have, I've used a, b- a bunch of them and I love them, but I, I like that singular of purpose aspect of those knives. There's no doubt on what those daggers are for. They're not for cleaning your teeth or picking your toenails or whatever it is people do with knives. They're for stabbing stuff. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco from theknifejunkie.com. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Episode 17 of the Knife Junkie Podcast, Bob. We're rocking and rolling right along. Yep, sweet 17. That's right. Well, I like that. Got a a great interview coming up for us. We'll uh, talk about that in just a second. But first, I'd like to uh, let folks know that if you've ever wanted a website, I recommend Bluehost for hosting that website. And now, more than ever, it's a great time to use Bluehost for your website hosting because they've just announced a new service called BlueSpark. It's a free service for all Bluehost customers leveraging WordPress. It's designed to jumpstart the build phase of a new WordPress website. Bluehost Spark is powered by a team of WordPress experts specifically trained to assist with everything from getting started with WordPress to installing plugins to access and navigation, initial setup questions, a whole lot more. To get started with Bluehost and Blue Spark, just visit theknifejunkie.com slash blue. That's theknifejunkie.com slash blue to get your website up and running. Bob, a great interview coming up for us today. But first, you've got some exciting news we want to talk about. Well, that's right. Actually, uh, Rob Penna from Snaggletooth Tactical, who we spoke to on the podcast uh, last week, sent along uh, some Snaggletooth MF uh, pocket deployers uh, for thumb stud knives. He wants us to give them away. Uh, I thought I was just going to take them and put them on all of my cold steel knives, but then he said, no, you got to take them. You got to give them away to people to, who need them. So, Jim, we're going to do a giveaway. Okay. And uh, so all you have to do is go to the knifejunkie.com slash SMF. That's for Snaggletooth MF, which is the name of the product. That will take you directly to the YouTube page, which has the Knife Junkie podcast interview with Rob Penna. On that page, you'll want to subscribe to the channel there and leave a comment. And I will be taking okay. a look at the comments. And, uh, you know, just let uh, Jim and I know why you want a Snaggletooth uh, MF for your uh, knife with a removable thumb stud, and uh, I'll go with the best answers. Okay. So uh, maybe not the most deserving person or I I don't know, but best answer, how's some criteria going to work for that? Well, geez, Jim, I don't know. I guess the question is... uh, Whoever write, uh, the answer is whoever writes the most compelling reason. Oh. And you know, I'm easy. I, I, you know, you don't have to, all you could say is uh, I want it and it looks cool. And that just <laughs> might do it for me. Right, right. Okay. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash SMF. That'll take you to the YouTube page with Rob Penna's interview on it. So subscribe to the knifejunkie.com uh, YouTube channel and leave a comment. And then Bob will go through those comments and pick some winners and then uh, kind of do the private message stuff on YouTube to get the address and all that. Again, it's free. It's a giveaway. And thanks to Rob for doing that. Yeah, thanks, Rob. You know you're a knife junkie if you answer to the nickname Blade. Let's get to the show today, Bob. Uh, somebody that you were talking to me about since we decided to start the podcast about yeah. wanting to interview this guy. And now yeah, you that's, are. That's right. He's an innovator uh, in the folding knife world. And uh, some of his knives, just his designs resonate with me so much. I'm talking about Les George. Yes, I speak with Les George today on the uh, podcast. And uh, we talk about his uh, design philosophy. We talk about his background in the Marine Corps uh, Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit. And we talk about uh, knives and how how he uses them and how he designs them. And we had a fascinating conversation. He's a really great down-to-earth guy, and it was uh, it was an honor he came on to the show. All right. Looking forward to that. Subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. On this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast, I'm speaking with a true luminary of the world of modern folding knives. His designs class up the product lines of Kershaw, Zero Tolerance, ProTech, 
and a process he popularized while trying to meet market demands for his handmade knives have made him famous. That's right, I'm speaking with none other than Les George. Les came on my radar with his quote-unquote Sabenza killing VSEP when that started making the rounds on YouTube a few years back. I was immediately drawn to the design. It resonated so much that when I finally got my hands on something close, the ProTech Rockeye Auto, a collaboration with ProTech and Les George, I finally emailed Mr. George a tear in my eye to tell him how cool I thought it was, and he was gracious enough to return my email. We'll flash forward three or so years, and here he is on the podcast. Les, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. We usually like to break the ice on this show with something like a pocket check. So I'm assuming you carry a knife daily. What do you have in your pocket today? Oh, right now I have a Frankenstein knife that I put together out of some parts. It's a, a Wilson Combat Eagle, a knife I make for Wilson Combat. It's got a, Damas a Damascus blade and a DLC frame. Oh, man, that sounds gorgeous. I love the... Uh... I love the frame of the um, of the eagle and the sort of subtle recurve of that blade. Uh, I'm a real sucker for your design, so I will I will keep coming back to that from time to time. But you know, I was asking Jim if he thought this was a little uh, I don't know too on the nose. But today, uh, just to get ready for this interview, I've been carrying my zero tolerance zero nine two zero based on your harpy, and it is such an awesome awesome knife. It it. Uh, it not only checks off a bunch of boxes for me personally in terms of blade length and blade style, and I do love a recurve, and I, I love the sort of harpoon top and the and the jimped thumb ramp, but the uh, the handle, the ergonomics, everything about it is is really awesome. And then it and then it takes uh, it takes another turn uh, where there's something about it that I can't quite explain. But yeah, I really dig that knife. Well done on the design. Thank you, thank you. Let's start with this. Uh, let's get some background. I know that you were in the Marine Corps for quite some time uh, before becoming a knife maker. Where did you serve and what job function did you, uh, did you do in the Marine Corps? I had a couple different jobs when I was in. I was in for just over 10 years. I started out as a heavy equipment mechanic, and then I volunteered and was accepted for Marine Security Guard duty. So I was an embassy guard, and I was in Mozambique and Barbados as an embassy guard. And then after that, I decided to get a new job yet again, so I went to uh, do EOD and make the bad bomb stop. So EOD, what's that stand for? Explosive Ordnance Disposal. It's like the Marine Corps' bomb squad, for lack of a better term. Got you. So kind of a stress-free sort of position. Yeah, I mean, it's either either got it right or it's someone else's problem. <laughs> interesting, interesting. So were knives, were knives a part of your uh, daily kit for that kind of uh, ordnance uh, disposal? Oh, yeah. We had all kind of knives and all those jobs. There were knives all around. They're not, it's not like being in the military or Marines or whatever makes you a knife expert by any means, but there's knives around. And some of them are good. Some of them are not good. And you make do with what you got like everything else. Well, I do remember seeing um, several fixed blade designs. They looked like very beefy, uh, straight sort of uh, faceted tantos. And uh, I remember reading something about them being valuable for uh, searching for mines uh, in sand, uh, that, that specific shape. Did you, uh, do you create knives for uh, the men and women who serve in the Marine Corps still doing what you were doing? Yes, I have a knife. It's the, uh, the M12. And because the, the official EOD knife when I was in was the M11. And then after I'd been out for a little while, that company, Land Clay, went out of business. So the, the my, people I knew in the Marine Corps Technical Division for uh, EOD called me and, and asked me if I'd buy that company and start making those knives. And I told them I would not because those knives were dumb. <laughs> so how were they dumb? You, were they designed by people other than uh, the people using them? They were, just, they were designed and made by non-knife people is what, kind of what it came down to. So just the geometry of the blade. And, and there's a lot of cool features involved in them, but they were not cutting instruments, really. So they asked me if I had designed my own knife for them, and I said yes. And it, it, long story short, my knife, my M12 knife, and a Medford knife were both entered into the Marine Corps' SL3, the stock list, for the technician's kit, as they called suitable substitutes for the M11. So basically the end units get to decide which of those two knives they'd like to have if they want to spend the money on them. I got you. So they're not general issue, but but they are approved for that job if they want to drop drop the dough. 
Right. That is so cool that you could be in a position, an official work position, and actually uh, be carrying a Les George knife or a Medford knife. That's that's pretty cool. Have you always been a knife guy, um, uh, you know, since before the Marine Corps? Yeah, I made my first knife when I was about 12. I sold my first knife in 92. I listed in 97 just for a timeline. So uh, what was your first knife like, and how did you go about making it? It's horrible. It was, uh, I took a, a circular saw blade, and I, I cut, took a hacksaw, and I cut a slot of metal out of that circular saw blade. At the time, though, I didn't know circular uh, hacksaw blades were your disposable items. You should switch them out <laughs> when they get dull. So I kept sawing on that thing for two weeks to get the, to make those two cuts of metal. It took two weeks, and... Fortunately, I've always been too stupid to quit, so I just never did. Well, you truly earned it. <laughs> yeah. My 12-year-old ass was dumb, but strong. <laughs> so uh, how did you get into making knives more on a professional level after the Marine Corps? Well, it started a little before I got out because, uh, you know, I, as I was my first, you know, eight, six or eight years or so in the Marines, I, I didn't live in the same country for more than about six mo- 16 months, 18 months at the max. Then after about six years or so, I, uh, I, I was stationed in Hawaii, and I ended up staying, being in Hawaii for four years off and on you know, as I traveled and deployed, but my mail went to Hawaii for like four years. And when I was in Hawaii, I found out that I lived about three miles from a, a knife maker, Stan Fujisaka, who had subsequently taught Ken Onion how to make knives, and I met him at a show, and he's I, I kind of showed him one of the knives I was cobbling together in my uh, in my uh garage at the in hawaii and he's he said oh you should come you should come over to my shop and i'm i figured it was a social visit but you know we were just talking at a knife show where i met him and and you never know when someone says oh yeah come to my house and this and that you never know how much they're just talking to be nice and so i didn't put a whole lot of thought into it about two weeks after i got back uh stan called me on the phone and is like uh hey how come you haven't called me yet i'm like uh uh and he's like well when are you coming over I'm like, Saturday? He's like, okay, yeah, you be here at 8 o'clock. I'm like, okay, boss. And I didn't know what to expect when I went over there. And basically, I got there, and he looked me up and down and goes, eh, you're wearing grinding clothes. Get to work. <laughs> Man, that's nice. I mean, some people search their whole lives for a mentor. And uh, here, you had someone beating your door down. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. And someone who mentored uh, Ken Onion, no less. Yeah, I didn't give him my phone number. He looked me up in the phone book. <laughs> Stalker. That's awesome. Yeah, so I ended up going over to his place pretty much every Saturday that I was in Hawaii. I was pretty much going over to his place. And he really took, he really took me under his ring and really helped me out a lot. So what, what kind of things did, uh, what method of knife making did he show you? Were you forging things? Were, was it stock removal? Did he show you how to make folders? I, I forged back before I joined the Marines, but Stan did uh, strictly uh, stock removal folders, really. I had never hollow ground before, so he taught me how to hollow grind and how to make folding knives. So hollow grinding takes place on a contact wheel um, so that uh, it's a concave uh, scooped out flat, or not flat, but uh, bevel. Is that process more difficult than flat grinding? It just depends on who you ask. The easiest grind is the one you do all the time, and the hardest one is the one you never do. So because I don't flat grind anymore, that's harder for me because I just don't do it anymore. So most of your knives now primarily have a hollow grind, is that right? Yeah. And and what benefit do you um, do you attribute to the hollow hollow grind? There's no perfect anything. Like to anybody who says that their grind or their whatever method is better for whatever thing is is either selling something or they're just not getting the big picture of the world. Because it depends on better for what. It depends on what you're doing. So with a hollow grind, you get a little. You, you can sharpen the blade back further before it becomes too obtuse to be usable. You, get a, you can get a th- uh, thinner edge for a better slice. It, it just kind of depends on what you're kind of going for. Right. And so aside, uh, aside from performance, uh, if you're asking me, which uh, no one has yet, but I'll, I'll volunteer this information. I just love the way a, a hollow grind looks, too. And uh, I have to be honest, aesthetic, aesthetics play a lot into um, my appreciation uh, for knives. I was just uh, speaking with a friend of mine, and we were both kind of lamenting the fact that we don't have more daily tasks that actually require a knife. Uh, And uh, so 
I'm not ashamed to say that aesthetics plays into uh, you know some of some of the decision making for the knives I find appealing. And and when I saw the V set for the first time, you know, a few years back, it really uh, it resonated with me on a on an unlogical level or a non rational level. And and to me, it's the knife that puts you on the map, or at least puts you uh, out there, common enough for someone like me to find you. And so that this knife, the VSEP, is is not only really good looking, uh, as I've already mentioned, but it's it's uh, it's a great performer, and and also the ripple effects of your producing this knife and the demand for this knife and what you had to do to get these knives out the door to customers who wanted them, kind of popularized a new process. Can you talk a little bit about the VSEP? So the VSEP is what I call a mid tech, and the way I do mid techs it, right now, it's gone through some changes as I've developed my skill sets and equipment. But now the only difference between a mid tech and a custom is I don't grind the blades on the mid techs. So I make all the parts. I, I profile the blades here in the shop. I make the handles. I, mean, I send out water jet and double disc grinding and bevel grinding and uh, heat treating. But uh, I'm doing everything else in the house. I, I know a lot of guys just have just basically have the knives sent to them and they sharpen them. <laughs> but that's, that's just not how I do it because I don't, I just, I just want to have the control of it myself. I, I've come to terms in the last couple of months that I'm kind of a control freak and I didn't think I was. <laughs> Apparently I've been in denial for a while now. It's good to know yourself. I guess so. I don't know. I don't like it. And, and also in this, in this uh, world of super anal knife collectors and, and you know, I, I I don't I'm not saying that in a begrudging way. You, you spend four hundred dollars on a knife. You want it to be. You have certain expectations. And I would imagine that if you're producing a mid tech knife, but it's not kind of coming through your hands before it goes to the owner, you're going to have a lot more warranty issues, and you're going to have a lot more people complaining about things that you could have controlled from the get go. Well, it's not so much that there there's warranty issues or things you can control, but there's like I said before, there's more than one way to do a thing. And even though these things are different, they might not be wrong. Hmm. So if, if if a knife is, you know, any given way, there's some kind of a judgment call on whether it's right or wrong or, or it's preferred one way or another. And someone gets a hold of me about it, I can say, okay, I did this for this reason. Not I spec the knife out and trusted the guy to do a good job and he sent it to me and that's how that's what we got now. Right. So it's it's just a, I, I'm responsible for it. So I try to to do it. Well, let me ask you, on the full production side, you have uh, quite a few designs out there being produced by Kershaw um, and Zero Tolerance. I have uh, I have the 0920, as I mentioned, and I also have the uh, Protec Rockeye Automatic, which is just such a cool knife. So how does it work in terms of um, your designs and prototyping and stuff like that when you're working with a really large company? Is it a much different process than how you run your own shop? It's not different. It's just on a different scale. You know, I go to the I go to the Kershaw or the zero tolerance shop in Oregon, and I know what's going on when we go to any any given station. I can look at it and like, all right, here I know what's going on here. I know what they're doing. It's just like what I do at my shop. Only they got fifteen guys lined up doing it instead of just me right. in a pole bar in Mississippi. Do you come up with designs that you think would make good production knives that could uh, scale up to that kind of uh, those kind of unit numbers and offer them designs, or do they come pick through your sketchbook and say, "Oh man, we got to make that"? How does that work? It's a it's, it's a combination of things. Like you could take uh, if you take Kershaw for example, we had four knives come out at Shot Show, and two of the knives I, I a couple years ago I go in there with this I had like twenty one. 21 designs to show them. Wow. And uh, they picked out the uh, Boilermaker and the Innuendo. They picked those out of the crew. And they're like, oh, yeah, we like these two. We're going to do those. And I'm like, all right, hey, you should really look at this, the Seguin, too. I really like that, and I'd really like you guys to do that. And they're like, eh, okay. So uh, I got them to do that. And then at the same meeting, they're, they they asked me if I would look at some of the the World War II knives that I like so much and the old yes. kind of retro designs, and they asked me if I could uh, make some folders out of those. So I took the M3 and made the they call it the XCOM now. So uh, tell the audience what the M3 is. Or the M3 was. is it, it it was a a knife from World War II. 
they, they started making them in either 1942 or 1943. The, the, the date escapes me right now. They made, I, I don't know how many millions of them. And uh, they, they shipped them out primarily to army units in Europe. So they were a symmetrical blade with like a bayonet grind. The same blade goes on to the, the M4, the M6, and the M7 bayonet, I believe. Stack leather handle, kind of that Coke bottle shaped handle. Mm-hmm. So I tried to translate that knife into a folder, and I, I think I did a pretty good job. I really like the knife. I've seen the the SHOT Show videos. It's really cool. It's very evocative of that knife. I mean, you don't even have to hear what you just said to know exactly uh, what you're going for and what your design cues were. Uh, I was just uh, refreshing myself looking through your Instagram page, and you have a custom that is uh, has the same sort of general shape. Isn't that right? Yeah, I've only made a couple of them so far, but I, I plan to be doing some more of those soon. So you have your shop where your custom knives and your mid-tech knives are made. You have this full production side where you have a couple of great companies that uh, you you know you have their ear and you can show them what you want. And uh, and then you have your passion projects, which I follow on Instagram. And and I I think these stem from your love of historical knives. And you have uh, from from what I can tell, you have quite a collection. Tell me a little bit about your passion for daggers in particular and uh, the, the 1918 trench knife. Oh, daggers are cool. I like daggers. We've talked about a lot of my production collaborations. We can't leave out the, the dagger I have with Spartan. Uh, that was uh, won a, a Blade Show Award in 2014. The V14 dagger, is it, it came off of that line that you're talking about. So we you know, we'd talked to Spartan about doing something and, we were, we were going along, and Curtis DeVito, my, my main man there at Spartan, I'm not thinking of anything from Mark, of course, but he said, uh, he texted me one day, he's like, hey, man, th- someone else is coming out with another dagger. Do you even want to bother doing that project anymore? And I'm like, yeah, dude, let's do that. Let's do it, but let's let's unscrew the design. Let's get rid of all the things in the design that, that I know that Fairburn and Sykes both hated. Because, I mean, they, they, they were made in a time where they had to make compromises. So we made that knife as hopefully the next step in the process, like how they wrote down all their design intent for those knives. So I went and read all that and I tried to, to do what they meant to do, but with, with a, another 70 years of advances in you know, manufacturing technology and materials. So going back to the circle back around the original question, I like daggers partly because they're so singular in purpose. There's a simplicity of intent and design there. The inner world that tries to make multi tools or little pocket pry bars with you know 15 different functions or you know Swiss Army knives or you know Leatherman tools, which are all great products and I have I've used a, b- a bunch of them and I love them, but I I like that singular of purpose aspect of those knives. There's no doubt on what those daggers are for. They're not for cleaning your teeth or picking your toenails or whatever it is people do with knives. They're for stabbing stuff. And I just think it's I just I just like them. I can quit and tell what I want, though. I don't want. In the knife community, there's a, a very concerted effort to paint out the role of knife as weapon. It's like, oh, well, this is just a tool I carry around with me every day. Yeah, it is, of course, uh, but it, it's, it's got a, a, a pedigree you can't deny, and it also has a utility that you can't deny also. The dagger, yes, it is singular in purpose. Then you look at the, the 1918 trench knife, and... It's not singular in purpose. It has a number of purposes, but they're all uh, they're all dark. To make that, uh, you did you start to learn uh, casting, bronze casting, or no? I uh, I took an original handle. I had it three D scanned, and then a friend of a friend of mine works in the movie business on special effects, and he did a lot of the movie effects for the last version of Tron that came out, and he got a hold of that that three D scanned file and fixed all the flaws in that hundred year old casting. And basically smoothed it up and made it the perfect version of that and what that knife was supposed to be. And I took that file and I sent it to a titanium casting place and they cast those handles in titanium. Because that's a casting in titanium is a little above a, a backyard project. That that takes very specific kind of facility, I'm assuming. Yeah, they're investment cast. So what they did is they 3D print a, a wax model of the knife and then they cover it with what they call investment. And then they burn out the wax, and then they basically pour that hot titan- uh, hot titanium into that cavity where the wax used to be. So as a knife maker, 
is making a dagger blade, grinding a dagger blade, to me seems like it would be the hardest, most frustrating because you're dealing with symmetry uh, in four quadrants. Just like I said earlier, the hardest thing to grind is the thing you never grind. And the easiest thing to grind is the thing you grind all the time. I don't grind daggers all the time, but I grind them enough to where it's not a big deal for me to step up and grind a, grind a dagger blade. What, what about your own personal collection? Is it, uh, do you have a, a pretty vast collection of uh, historical blades? I have pretty much every allied knife, I think. Not like every variation of every style, but I think I have an example of every one except for uh, the OSS dagger with the pancake flapper sheath. That's the only one I don't have yet. I saw something that you made that looks kind of like a small sm uh, smatchet, um, and it had the mill lines still on the, uh, on the bevels. Was that, uh, was that taken from the smatchet and just sort of uh, shrunk down a little bit? That's like a smatchet blade on my EOD knife handle. That knife has a 9-inch blade, and there's precedent for 9-inch blades in original smatchets. Like everything, they ran the gamut. But that's a, it's a smaller scat smash it, but there's a precedent for a nine inch blade already. I got you. So you're saying that they, they actually did make those to that spec and uh, it had a certain purpose. Yeah, on that length, it, there's, a, there's some historical precedent for that. So do you have another sort of uh, historical passion project in the offing, something you're, you're starting to think about? I just cut out the prototypes. I'm thinking about doing the Australian Army Utility Knife. Or combat knife, I forget what they call it. It's the non that is it's a it's a symmetrical blade, but it's not a dagger. Sort of very wispy handle, right? Uh, very, it gets thin and and widens out kind of radically, and then gets thin again. It's got it's it's like th thicker up towards the guard, and then about midway down the palm, it's it tapers down pretty dramatic. And then it's got like a bird head. It's got a very dramatic bird head peak on the back of the handle. The problem with these Australian knives is I don't think they ever had formal names, so they they've been given acronyms through the years, and I, I've been hitting the head a lot, and I forget my acronym. During your 11 years, it's been 11 years as a full-time knife maker, about. Is that correct? That's right. All right, so you've, you've no doubt seen the industry change and evolve, or hopefully evolve. Uh, how has the knife world changed since you started, and what direction do you want to see it heading in? I'm not often introspective enough to pick up on a lot of these kind of things. I'm just kind of doing, doing whatever it is I do, and hopefully it works out. Um, in the last 11 years, I couldn't even tell you how it's changed. If you, if you look at the VSEP and uh, sort of the, the popularizing of mid-tech knives, I feel, like, uh, I feel like things shifted with that knife. I don't know if I give it uh, too much credit, but I feel like things shifted a little bit with that knife because it opened doors. It, it allowed people to um, have a design from a maker who was otherwise out of reach in a way uh, that wasn't a, a $20 Kershaw, but also wasn't the $1,200 Genuine article. So to me, that's, that's how it's changed. And I was wondering if you, if you shared that perspective. That is, that, that's definitely been a different, a big difference. I think that when I ran the second batch of the VSEPs, people kind of noticed it then as a as a successful project. Because, you know, a lot of guys since then even have made a run of mid-techs or, or maybe, a, maybe a second. But at the time, other than Hinder and Strider and, you know, Chris Reeve knives, kind of doing lives along the same weight class, not a lot of people had done that before. And then when, they, when I did that second batch and I brought a bunch of them to Blade Show that year, I think a lot of other knife makers kind of took notice of the idea and be like, well, if this idiot can do it, I could probably do it. <laughs> so I think it popularized the concept, I think. I agree. And I'm so glad it did because it not only put your designs within reach, but it put the designs of a lot of other people within reach. And then, and then, uh, you know, also you have companies like ZT and Kershaw and whatnot also making that possible. So uh, from my perspective, your contributions to the knife world are many and influential part of, of, your, of your career. I love your, your designs. They just resonate. And your design language, uh, I, I feel like I can always pick out a George knife. Tom Mayo told me I should have a style, so I, I probably figured he's probably right. Tom Mayo's got quite a style himself. <laughs> he does. Well, uh, listen, Les, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really, uh, really appreciate your coming on and sharing some of your knowledge and some of your history. 
with us. It's been uh, really great talking to you. And uh, I just wanted to ask, is there anything you want to, uh, you want to let people know before we sign off? The uh, only thing I have left to say is thank you for letting me come on board. And thank you to everybody who continues to support my knives, buy my junk, and keep me from having to get a real job because I do not want a real job. So I really appreciate everybody who supports my, my knives and my collaborations and all the knife shows and all the stuff. I, I keep getting overwhelming support. And I just can't tell you how grateful I am, even if some of you guys drive me a little nuts sometimes. I still love you. <laughs> well, just tell everyone where they can find you online. You can find me at all the major social media things or on my website, georgeknives.com. All right, Les. Again, thanks for coming on the podcast, and I hope to talk to you sometime soon. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. Have a question or maybe you just have a comment? Give us a call at 724-466-4487. We'll answer your question on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. That number again, 724-466-4487. Fascinating interview, Bob, there, and I know you were just excited to talk to Les George. And uh, like you said at the beginning, just a down-to-earth guy, and uh, I found it really, uh, really interesting, too. Me, too. Actually, I got to say, going into it, I was a little concerned. They say, never meet your heroes because you're bound to be disappointed. You know, Les George is a is a knife design hero of mine, and uh, he's, he's a knife world hero of mine. So uh, I was uh, pleasantly pleased that meeting him was a, was a good experience, and he didn't end up being <laughs> some sort of crazy man. Yeah, Les right. George was a cool and stand-up guy. And I love hearing when regular down-to-earth people do extraordinary things. Right. And you didn't act too crazy either, so. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Mr. George. Yeah, none of that, right? Right, right. Hey, Bob, got to ask you really quickly. I saw something uh, on my knife feed in the news I get. Something about mm-hmm. Benchmade and their Griptilian. Something about uh, discontinuing the, the Griptilian. Did I, meet, did, did I misread that? Oh, Jim, Jim, it's a panic. Benchmade is sinking their flagship, the Griptilian. What? They're what? discontinuing it after all these years. No. In 154 CM, and they're reintroducing the entire Griptilian line in uh, CPM S30V steel. So basically, uh, they're just phasing out the 154 CM steel they've been using on the Griptilian for uh, 20 years and bringing in a still, some might argue, uh, a still a little slightly antiquated super steel, the S30V, which has been improved upon over the years. Uh, but still, S30V is an awesome steel, if not a mm. slight bit chippy for those of you who have any impact uses. But anyway, yeah, the, the Griptilian is not going anywhere. Anywhere. That that is uh, Benchmade's bread and butter. They're just bringing it back out in S30V, which they've been doing with a lot of their knives over the past two years. So rest easy, sir. There there's still time for you to get one. Oh, okay, all right. Oh, and and not for nothing. Here's an here's another little tidbit. The uh, Andrew Demko AD15 and AD10 now being produced by Cold Steel. There's one on the way to my house. I have to check it out. These are uh, Cold Steel production versions of the Andrew Demko uh, legendary custom knives that originally introduced the triad lock. So uh, it should be cool when they get here. I'll, I'll let everyone know how awesome they are. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, speak- I'm excited. Yeah, speaking about the Griptilian and steel, just want to remind folks to uh, go back into the archives. It wasn't that long ago, episode 13, we talked to uh, Laren Thomas, the Knife Steel Nerds. Just find that uh, interview at thenifejunkie.com slash 13, and you can uh, get, uh, get your uh, Knife Steel Nerd on uh, by listening to that interview. In that uh, in that interview, he actually sings the praises of 154 CM and CPM 154. He talks about how good they are at being middle of the road and forgiving and sharp. So it is a very good steel they're phasing out. But uh, in the age of super steels, I guess it's time. Right. I want to thank you again for listening to our show today, Interview with Les George. If you want to uh, reference it later or share it with friends, just go to thenifejunkie.com slash 17. That's the easy way to find it. And remind you that today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash knifejunkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, go to audibletrial.com slash knife junkie. Bob, that's going to wrap it up for number 17, but number 18 is going to be going to be a great show as well. You want to give a little quick preview? Well, here's a little hint. It's going to be epic. How's that? Oh. That's a little hint, right? Epic? A little hint. A little hint. Yeah, maybe there ties in with a, a creature that's uh, popular around... April sometime Easter and 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 you might want to cuddle with it. All right, all right. Okay, we'll, that's we'll talk enough. about that. <laughs> that's too much. 
Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.